On the 2nd of December 1978, in the quiet city of San Jose, the Golden State Killer slipped into the home of a registered nurse, his latest victim. At the time, the man wasn't known by that alias. Instead, he was known by a more evil, more explicit name, the East Area Ra- or E-A-R. In this nurse's home, the intruder forced the nurse to tie her husband's hands behind his back as he lay helplessly on the floor. Then. He blindfolded and gagged them before walking into the kitchen to get some dishes. Now, you might be wondering what a rapist serial killer would want with the dishes. Well, you are about to find out. The EAR placed the dishes on the back of the nurse's husband. He then whispered these words into the man's ear. If these plates fall, I'll hear them and I'll kill you if I hear them fall. Then he grabbed the nurse, pressed a knife to her neck, and assaulted her while her husband listened helplessly, unable to protect his wife and unable to defend his family. After this monster was done with the assault, he went back into their kitchen and did something so bizarre, it baffled investigators for decades. The nurse heard the intruder crying and calling a woman's name in the kitchen. He was saying, Bonnie, I hate you. In a few moments, EAR would disappear into the darkness. However, the damage and trauma he had inflicted on this woman would remain for decades. She was not his first victim. And unfortunately, she wasn't the last either. Welcome or welcome back to Twisted Minds. My name is James and today we are going to deep dive into the decades old and incredibly diabolical case of the Golden State Killer. Long before he would be known as the elusive East Area Ra and even longer before the word referred to him as the Golden State Killer, he was known by a more domestic alias. From 1973 to 1976, he was known as the Visalia Ransacker, a burglar who managed to commit 120 burglaries without getting caught. One of his first recorded burglaries was the theft of $50 from a piggy bank. However, that would be the most valuable thing that would be stolen in a while. The Visalia ransacker broke into homes with no intention of actually stealing anything. Most of the things he took were not valuable. He would ignore banknotes, diamond earrings, and he'd go for low value items. Through all of this, the police found it difficult to catch the Visalia ransacker because he was incredibly efficient at covering his tracks. He was also a meticulous planner. He established routes of escape and often established multiple points of entry and exit in whatever house he burgled. He also wore gloves that ensured he left no fingerprints. Then an incident happened on the 11th of September 1975 that turned this harmless intruder into something of a bloodthirsty killer. Claude Snelling, a 45 year old journalism professor at the College of Sequoias was sound asleep when he heard a noise coming from his daughter's bedroom. It was 2 a.m. that night, and he had every reason to be concerned because an incident had occurred some months before that that had put his entire household on high alert. In February of that same year, Professor Snelling had chased a prowler who he caught peeping into his 16-year-old daughter's window around 10 p.m. So this time, he raced out of the house and toward the carport where the noise was coming from. There, he confronted a masked man who was attempting to kidnap his daughter. The man shot Snelling twice, and the professor staggered back into the house to his wife before he died. Meanwhile, the masked man fled the scene on foot, leaving behind a stolen bike. Snelling's daughter, on the other hand, was too traumatized to speak and had to be hypnotized before she could give any details that would help the police identify the Visalia ransacker turned killer. The neighborhood immediately went into high alert. Stakeouts were set up around houses that had been victims of a break-in, but that didn't stop the ransacker. Just a couple months later, on the 12th of December of the same year, the Visalia ransacker broke into a compound, but unknown to him, there was a detective who was on stakeout duties inside the garage. The detective, William McGowan, was able to get the suspect to surrender and unmask himself after McGowan fired. But the mystery man had other ideas. In a split second when his guard was low, the suspect pulled out a gun, shot at the detective's face, shattering his flashlight and escaping. McGowan described the shooter as a white male, 25 to 35 years of age, 5'10", 
and 180 pounds or more. He had a round face, a cleft in his chin, a wide jaw, and his nose had a distinctive shape when the offender's profile was seen. He had a thick neck, his hair was short, light blonde, with no sideburns. It was longer on the top and parted on the left side. The officer described it as a military haircut as it was shorter than most boys and men were wearing. He had light skin with no signs of whiskers or stubble. Under hypnosis, the officer described him as baby-faced. The officer described the ransacker's shoulders as large and round, and he had a large lower half with large legs, large hips and thighs, and a large behind. He also described the man's feet as stubby. However, since he had already been spotted, the Visalia neighborhood never heard or suffered another incident from the ransacker again. With the turn of the new year in 1976, the Visalia ransacker took his services elsewhere. He moved to the Sacramento area where his petty burglary suddenly escalated into sexual assault. For three years, the Visalia ransacker was known as the East Area Rape of the communities of Rancho Cordova, Citrus Heights, and Carmichael. This psycho had a specific method for choosing victims. He targeted one-story homes in middle-class neighborhoods. His preferred victims were women who lived alone near a school, creek, or a field where he could quickly make an escape. He would watch the women and learn their routine until he knew it like the back of his hand. Then, he would break into their house whenever their home was empty and learn every entrance and every exit within the house. He would plant ropes in select spots. He would unload guns and unlock doors beforehand to prepare the house for his ill-fated visit. He was so meticulous that by the time he would make his move, he would get in and out of the house at a moment's notice. Most times, the women he attacked were either single or alone because their husbands were away. However, the EAR wasn't bound to this restriction and he would attack couples while they were home as well. The story we began with is a perfect example. This madman would break into a couple's home while they were asleep, force the wife to tie the husband up, stack several dishes on his back while the man was bound to the floor, and warn him not to let the plates make a sound or he would return to kill him. Then he would take the man's wife to a room next door and take sexual advantage of her. After this madness, while most predators would just leave the house, the EAR would linger, make a meal, or watch the horizon from their porch. All of the extracurricular activities he engaged in while he was on his rampage definitely left a ton of DNA evidence around a house enough to implicate him. However, this was the 70s and there was only so much anyone could do with DNA back in the day. The man knew that and exploited it to its limits. Victims spoke about how after assaulting them, he would walk out of the room and they would assume he had left, only for him to step out of the darkness to continue the assault. This would make the victims too scared to move for hours after he had finally gone, which gave the man more than enough time to escape. However, the most insulting and nerve-wrenching thing were the calls the monster would make to the victims he had already attacked and traumatized. Hello? As a direct result of these attacks, the entire area of Sacramento fell into a state of fear. The women were frightened and the police held town hall meetings to discuss the situation, sensitize one another, how they could mobilize in the event of another attack, and most importantly, how they could catch this elusive predator. There was an incident of a man who berated his neighbors for allowing their wives to be insisting that it could never happen to him. Later that year, he was paid a visit. The EAR was beyond audacious. After the town hall meeting, he phoned the police and told them where his next attack would happen. The police quickly rallied to the spot, but they were too late. He had already committed a crime on a 13-year-old child while her parents were home. The parents were not even aware of the break-in, and they watched from a distance as the masked monster escaped into the night. By this time, he had already taken advantage of more than 40 women. One night in February 1978, a young Sacramento couple 
Brian Majare and his wife Katie were walking their dog in the Rancho Cordova area. Brian was a military policeman at Mather Air Force Base and was spending some much needed time with his wife when they encountered the EAR. Investigators are not exactly sure what happened, but these are the details they are certain about. One, Brian Majare was shot first and Katie Majare fled the scene screaming for help. Two, she was chased and also shot to death by the East Area Rape. Three, the likely reason that Brian and Katie were targeted was because of the proximity of their stroll to the area where the rape had just committed a crime. The police were befuddled. They had no idea who the man was or how to catch him. And murder was now added to an already unbearable pile of sexual misconducts. The worries that the police expressed were completely valid because EAR started getting comfortable with murder at an alarming rate. After committing 50 confirmed incidents of rape on the women of the Sacramento area, the man moved his twisted business to Southern California. His first attack was botched October 1st, 1979. It was a glorious error. The couple escaped, alerted neighbors, and the rape was forced to flee. However, his next victims weren't so lucky. On December 30th, 1979, Robert Offerman and Deborah Manning were sound asleep when the infamous man slipped into their bedroom, tied up Robert, and assaulted Deborah before killing them both. At this point, they were calling him the original Night Stalker. On the 13th of March, 1980, Charlene and Lyman Smith were also sleeping in their house when this rebranded original Night Stalker perpetrated the same act he had done to his last victims. Unfortunately, with them, he opted to use a log of wood he had gotten from a fireplace as his choice of weapon for taking their lives. 21st of August, 1980, Keith Eli Harrington, a 24-year-old medical student, and Patrice Harrington, a 27-year-old nurse were found bludgeoned to death by Keith's father. The two had married three months prior and were still settling into their married life when the original Night Stalker invaded their lives and took everything from them. After this particular incident, the police began to wonder whether the killer had a background in the Navy or the military because the knots they found on his victims were quite advanced. It wasn't the kind of knot you would expect from an average person. People even began calling him the diamond knot killer for a time. However, it didn't take too long for people to begin to think that the killer might have some police background because of how elusive he was. Well, while everyone wondered, the crimes continued. On the 6th of February, 1981, a 28-year-old Manuela Withun was at home alone. Her husband was in the hospital at the time, recovering from an illness when she was attacked, tied, assaulted, and bludgeoned. Her husband was named a suspect in the crime, even though he was at the hospital at the time. DNA evidence would later clear him, but he passed away before he could ever see justice served. On the 27th of July, Sherry Domingo and Greg Sanchez were at her residence when the attacker entered the house through a bathroom window and attacked. Greg tried to tackle the intruder, but he was shot in the mouth before being bludgeoned with a gardening tool. Sherry, on the other hand, was tied up, assaulted, and also killed. Then, this famed monster committed his last crime on an 18-year-old girl named Janelle Lisa Cruz. Like all the other ladies before her, she had been assaulted and bludgeoned. After this, he stopped. There was no record of any crime by the criminal, and it seemed that he had either retired or disappeared. It is important to note that through all of these crimes, from 1973 to 1981, no one knew it was the same person. No one knew that the Visalia Ransacker, the EAR, and the original Night Stalker were all the same person. It wasn't until advances in DNA were made that the truth was brought to light. They were dealing with a heartless, prolific criminal who had now happened to be nowhere. And this is where everyday people become superheroes. As months turned into years, years into decades, and victims numb from unanswered questions, the Golden State Killer became a cold case that frustrated the California police and thus had been abandoned. But a journalist named Michelle McNamara 
who had a burning desire to uncover the case and find the killer, teamed up with like-minded friends, and they devoted so much time toward the case that the world was forced to listen. She brought the case from the dark hole that it had scurried into and wrote an article that garnered national attention, a renewed interest from the police, and landed her a book deal. It was Michelle McNamara who coined the name Golden State Killer. However, her search for truth eventually took a toll on her health, and eventually, a homebrewed cocktail of pharmaceuticals that were meant to alleviate stress ended up aggravating an undiagnosed heart condition that ended her life. She died in her sleep in 2016 and never got to see the Golden State Killer captured. Meanwhile, the fire she had started was carried on. On the 15th of June 2016, the FBI released composite sketches of the Golden State Killer and announced a $50,000 reward. Meanwhile, detectives had begun using a method called genetic genealogy to track a possible lead. They obtained DNA of the Golden State Killer from a Ventura County rape kit that they had had from a case in the 1980s and still had on file. It was after they uploaded this DNA that they began to find their first lead in almost 40 years of investigation. Investigators had to build about 25 different family trees and over almost two years, they went through the age, sex, and residents of thousands of suspects until they narrowed it down to one man, Joseph D'Angelo. He was the only one who ticked all of the boxes perfectly. He had been a policeman during the time these crimes were committed. He also lived around the area at that time. So they tracked him down and found that he was still alive, old, but very alive. He was living with his daughters at the time, and neither they nor their mother suspected that he was a killer. So, after secretly obtaining DNA from him and confirming that he was indeed the Golden State Killer, the investigators arrested Joseph D'Angelo. This happened two years after Michelle McNamara's painful passing, and in the same year her book, was posthumously published. Joseph D'Angelo had preyed on communities while he was a police officer, while he was supposed to be protecting and serving them. This was why it was so difficult to find him. He was always several steps ahead of any community he attacked, and at least a step ahead of his colleagues who were investigating the cases. On the 21st of August, 2020, Joseph D'Angelo received multiple life sentences without the possibility of parole. He wasn't charged for the burglaries he committed, nor was he charged for the sexual crimes, but the victims that saw him sentenced expressed relief in knowing that he would spend the rest of his life rotting behind bars. Thankfully, the victims had gotten their more than deserved long-awaited closure. Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the case of Joseph D'Angelo. Why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.